Hi, my name is Marissa Voison, and this is my speech entitled Caffeine Addiction. So people tend to forget how something as simple as your morning cup of coffee has a global impact on life and the environment. Did you know that the world drinks about 1.5 billion cups of coffee every day? That's 2% of the entire world getting their morning fix. To get an idea of the importance of coffee in our lives, we'll discuss how coffee came to be, the controversy surrounding the bean, and the ecological impact. So who discovered this little red bean that grows on a shrub? Legend has it that a young Ethiopian boy named Kaldi was tending his goats when they were starting to eat a berry off a bush. They started to get really energetic and started dancing around, so Kaldi was like, hmm, I think I'll eat off that bush too. And so when he went to go eat off of it, he got this sudden burst of energy. And so every day, he started going back to the bush. And so this monk started noticing. And so the monk decided, well, I want to try the berries off the bush. And so the monk ate the berries off the bush, noticed the same effect, and decided to brew it into coffee so he could give it to the other monks so that way they would not stop falling asleep during prayer. Mm -hmm. So it started to catch on, and all the monks decided, you know, this is a good idea. We can pray longer and be more reverent. So that's kind of how it came to be. As I mentioned, Kaldi was Ethiopian, where the bean is originally from. The bean was first eaten between 575 and 850 CE, or about a thousand years ago. And then it was crushed with animal fat and eaten as ye old tramix to give quick bursts of energy on very long hunts. Coffee was first brewed between 1000 and 1300 CE, and around the 16th century, European travelers were visiting Ethiopia and began to journal about this strange magical concoction that was used to remedy stomach ailments. Once the Ottoman Empire began to expand is when the coffee really started to grow. Popularity grew so fast that the mid, during the mid-16th century, coffee houses popped up in Constantinople, Cairo, and Mecca. Due to the Ottoman Empire's monopoly, a man named Baba Budan smuggled the first germinable seeds from Mecca to Mysore, India in 1600. In 1660, Dutch colony spies smuggled whole plants to their country in Java, of course. Coffee was so well guarded in Turkey that it became grounds for divorce if a man refused coffee to his wife. Popularity in Paris skyrocketed, skyrocketed when in 1969, Turkish ambassador Solomon Aga visited Louis XIV's court, making both Turkish dress and coffee very fashionable. Just 10 years later, the Austrians were, looked, were hooked when the Turks were defeated in battle outside of Vienna and abandoned all of their supplies, including several hundred bags of coffee. During the time of the Ven Venetian during this time, Venetian traders are introducing coffee to Europe, and the first coffee house opened in Oxford in 1650. Surprisingly, it's very popular with the college kids. And by 1715, there are 2,000 coffee houses in London alone. Nothing quite as good and as fast growing as coffee can go unscrutinized for too long. During the 1600s, Mufti in Constantinople banned drinking coffee. The punishment of crap? You were sewn up into a leather sack and thrown into the street. Catholic priests were especially concerned about the Muslim drink, and in the 1500s went to Pope Clement, describing the drink as the drink of Satan. However, Pope Clement, being open-minded, had coffee brewed for him. He found that coffee was so appealing, he decided anything that good could not be made by the devil, baptized it, and made it the drink of Christians. In 1674, women of England were getting so fed up with the men for spending late nights at the coffee houses, which of course they weren't allowed into, they released a formal complaint called the Women's Petition Against Coffee, representing the public consideration, the grand inconveniences occurring to their sex from the excessive use of that during enfeebling liquid. The men answered by publishing the men's answer to the women's petition against coffee, vindicating their own performance and the virtues of their liquor from the undeserved aspirations lately cast upon them in their scandalous pamphlet. In other words, stop complaining. The next year, in 1675, Charles II suppressed coffee houses due to the potentially insidious speech and associations freely discussed in such venues. Announcements were posted forbidding the operation of all the coffee houses after January 10th. After only a couple of days of protests, the king gave up. Four years later in France, doctors held an assembly denouncing the benefits of coffee, 
since they had been losing business to the coffee houses. They claimed it was poison, dries up the kidneys, dries up the cerebral spinal fluid in the brain, opens up the pores of the body, produces obstinate wakefulness, insomnia, and caused general exhaustion, paralysis, and impotence. Germans in general were not impressed with coffee. It was not accepted into their homes until the late 1700s because it was un-German. They had a long-standing fondness of locally produced beer and continually prohibited coffee, raised taxes, and generally had libel directed against coffee, which made it very difficult for it to catch hold in their society. Not to mention they thought it caused sterility in women. In Prussia and Hanover, there was such distress about the amount of, the amount of money leaving the country and going to foreign countries that in 1777, Frederick the Great published the Coffee and Beer Manifesto, banning coffee and demanding that the subjects drink beer. Four years later, he gave up, and instead decreed that coffee must be roasted in royal roasting houses. Roasting licenses were made available for large fees, one only nobles, higher officials, and clergy could afford. The commoners were forced to seek cheaper solutions, so they either procured it illegally or they used chicory. Disabled soldiers became coffee snippers to discover illegal roasters. A more modern controversy is the ecological impact coffee has. Specialty coffee has only become really recently popular in the United States, um, gaining foothold only about 24 year, 25 years ago. Since then, many big name corporations have been produced from Starbucks to Folgers to Procter & Gamble to Nestle to just to name a few. During the 80s, El Salvador was experiencing a civil war. Folgers, who got their coffee beans from El Salvadorian farmers, were garnering a lot of flack for not stepping in and protecting their farmers from the death squads murdering activists, priests, um, politicians, and civilians. In 1994, activists targeted Starbucks for its lack of empathy towards the plight of Guatemalan farmers, citing child labor, low wages, and poor living conditions their crime. These types of scrutiny led to more consumer-friendly decisions being made by corporations. With a high demand being made for com compassionate coffee options that led to high environmental sustainability specialty markets for organic, fair trade, and bird-friendly coffees became more readily available. Wanting to jump on the wagon first and clear the name, Starbucks produced the first mainstream mass-marketed fair trade coffees. Fair trade is when companies focus their products being made in developing countries by paying higher prices to exporters, as well as rating, raising their social and environmental standards. There are several recognized fair trade um, certifiers, including Fair Trade International, IMO, and EcoSocial. In 2008, fair trade products amounted to $4.98 billion worldwide. Another option is certified organic. To be considered certified organic, you have to grow your coffee free from chemicals like DDT, malathion, and benzene hexochloride. Instead, farmers focus on good soil quality and plant health. They also typically keep a secondary shade plant over the coffee, weed with machetes, and fertilize with compost, spread, and spread disease-resistant mulch, and introduce beneficial insects to their crop that eat the pests. Certified organic sales account for 5% of specialty coffee sales. The, la the last thing to look for when looking for sustainable coffee is bird friendly. Bird friendly is a certification created by the Smithsonian Migratable Bird Center. To become a certified bird friendly coffee, you must first be organic certified. You must then provide a minimum of 40% shade coverage and also have a diversity of, and size of different trees on your, on your farm. These standards ensure habitats for all the different birds and all the different local wildlife in the area. From a humble bean on a shrub in Ethiopia to the widespread controversy and acceptance to the modern companies of today trying to raise the standard on the bean produced for our morning cup, coffee has and will continue to be an important part of our society. It's crucial to understand not only its origins, but to have a deep connection and respect for the environment and the people impacts by requiring more from ourselves and from the consumers. And as Thomas Jefferson says, coffee, it's the favorite drink of the civilized world. Thank you.